So you know where the temporal bone is. Temporal bone's on the side. If it'll mark, let's see if it'll. Temp temporal bone. Yeah, marks. Okay. Okay. The, it's where the temporal muscle attaches and connects to the lower mandible. Okay. This is where you get um, your migraine headaches from. The temporal muscle that attaches to the side of the temporal bone. When it tightens and you clench your teeth, that's one of the contributing factors or the gears that contribute to a migraine headache. I say if you clench your teeth or grind, that's when it starts a migraine headache. That's where you use an appliance that goes between the teeth and that helps prevent migraines. Doesn't cure them, but it kind of throws a, a, a rent um, a rent in the works there and helps prevent them. Okay, much better than the drugs like uh, and. and Ectomax, Intimax, is a drug for migraines, which is really nasty drug. So you got your temporal bone, you got your zygomatic bone. Zygomatic bone. It's going to repeat each one up on the side here. Remember, the zygomatic bone forms that arch, forms the lower socket of the eye. So in, on the lateral injury to the side of the skull, the zygomatic bone is the one that's broken, and you see the eye droop. That's one of the signs you look for in the ER when they come in with the broken zygomatic bone. Then the sphenoid bone. Sphenoid bone makes it the back of the eye sphenoid socket. Bone. Okay, you can see where it runs from the blue area. The ethmoid bone runs in between the sphenoid bone. Ethmoid bone. Okay, the ethmoid bone has the crystal galley and the uh, cribiform plate where the olfactory nerves run through. Maxilla. Is Maxilla. Okay. What well, has the upper teeth? And controls the front of the face. Okay. In frontal injuries, that's what gets fractured is your maxilla. Mandible. Mandible is a lower arch. Okay. And is connected to the uh, mandibular fossa of the temporal bone where it connects. Then you got the vomer bone. Vomer bone. On the lower part, the inferior part of the nasal cavity. You have the inferior nasal concha. Inferior nasal concha. Okay. You have a middle nasal concha and a, a superior nasal concha. There's three sets of them, six in total. Okay, the inferior one is the very bottom one. Everybody remembers the purpose of the, of the nasal concha, right? Any takers? Is it to warm the air? Yep, exactly what it does. It, it circulates the air before it goes into your lungs, into the trachea. It circulates and warms it. Okay, and it also produces the mucus, so uh, bacteria, pathogens, uh, pollen, dust, anything like that gets trapped in the mucus. It doesn't go into your lungs. Okay, that's what produces the mucus in the nose. So the inferior, the middle, and the superior nasal concha. Lac Lacrimal bone. Lacrimal bone. Everybody remembers that. Tears flow from the lateral portion cross the eye into the medial portion of the lacrimal ductus, and that drains into the, nas the nasal cavity. So when you cry, your eyes tear, that's where your nose runs, because the tear ducts drain into the nasal cavity through the lacrimal duct, which runs in the lacrimal bone. Nasal bone? Nasal bone. Okay, it's two bones that are fused, forms a bridge of the nose. And then everybody should know this one and remember this one. Frontal bone. Okay, the frontal bone is the most anterior bone in the skull. What's the most posterior bone in the skull? We talked about that. Occipital. Occipital bone. Perfect. And what? I wanted to say that. <laughs> want to say that? Okay. I like that word. <laughs> <laughs> you can say it. Go ahead. <laughs> occipital, right? Yep, that's it. Okay. Your occipital bone. You got it. All right. So let's shorten that. We'll go to the next slide for this. And you got the glabella, which is just superior to the mid portion by midline between the eyes. So middle between the eyes, the glabella is just a point of reference that we go by, like just superior to the middle of the eyes. You have the inferior orbital fissure. Fissure is a groove, okay? You can see that groove. And inferior orbital fissure. It's on the inferior portion of the, of the eye socket. Then you have your infraorbital foramen, which is an opening. In for orbital foramen. The foramen is a hole or an opening, right? This is a small one, and it's just below the eye socket. If you're doing dentistry, you can get that nerve numb, and you will numb the front 
three teeth on that side. The infrarotor nerve comes down and innervates your central, your lateral, and your cuspid. So if you're doing scaling, something like that, you want to get a patient number to block, you go to the infraorbital nerve rather than each individual nerve. That's your infraorbital foramen. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. All right, and you have the nasal spine, which comes up from the inferior surface. Okay, you can see the nasal spine. Let's see if we get that marked in blue. Yeah, nasal spine. It's that little point that comes right up there. What's that? Does that enlarge for everybody? Yes, it does. All right, perfect. That's the nasal spine. I mean, right at the tip there, the inferior part of the nose of the nose. Mental foramen. We didn't say that. Mental foramen. I spoke too soon. <laughs> All right, mental foramen. What's so important about the mental foramen? We talked about that last time. The mental foramen is where the in, uh, inferior mandibular nerve comes out. And it innervates the lower part of the teeth. That's what all the bottom teeth are innervated by. That's when the dentist gets you numb from working on a bottom tooth. That's why your lip gets numb. That exits right there and innervates your lip. Okay. It's also the reason people get a lot of root canals that they really don't need because it looks like an abscess. That's why if you have an, if that superimposes on an X-ray on the base of the tooth, you take another X-ray at a different angle. If the if the if the if that hole or that black circle moves, you know it's a framing. If it doesn't move, you know it's associated with the tooth. Okay, but that's your mental frame. That's the mental frame where the mental nerve comes out, innervates your lower lip from your inferior alveolar nerve. The alveolar, alveolar margin. Alveolar margin. Alveolar means teeth. That's what holds the sockets of the teeth, is your alveolar ridge or alveolar margin. Okay, both top and bottom. Then you have a perpendicular, perpendicular plate. Perpendicular plate. You can see it runs perpendicular to the skull. It runs in the back of the nose, and this is called the perpendicular plate, which separates the two nasal cavities. Then on top of the eye, superior orbital fissure. You have the superior orbital fissure. Remember the inferior orbital fissure on the bottom. We have the superior orbital fissure on the top, which is a group where the nerves and blood vessels join into the back of the orbital off socket. And you have your supraorbital notch. Okay. Supraorbital notch. And you see that ridge right there, the little notch in the skull? That's your supraorbital notch. It's going to take the, the high the low. You can see it right there. It's a little bit better that you can see it. But you see the notch right in the rim of the orbit. That supraorbital notch. I don't think I can draw on this, can I? Well, let me draw. This means it's screen room. All right. So labels. Okay. So far, so good. Different structures of the skull. We'll go through the skull, the thoracic cavity, and the something else. I forget what the other one is. Skull, vertebral column, and the thoracic cavity. Go through all the ribs. All right, so this is our first part. So on the side of the skull now, rather than the frontal approach, we have the big bone that makes up the side, which is your parietal bone. Parietal bone. Okay. In front of that, we have the temporal bone. Temporal bone. The temporal bone contains the TMJ, the temporal mandibular joint. That's the joint you can see where the man mandible, condo the condo of the mandible articulates in the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. Okay, That's what causes concussions for the most part. We put a mouth guard in there, help prevent that condyle from slamming into the temporal bone. We prevent a lot of concussions in football and other sports. Do we say the most, what's the, what's the one sport that has the most dental injuries of all sports? Did I say that last time? Okay, what sport has the most dental injuries? It's not football. Hockey? No, that's a good guess though, not hockey. Just because not as many people play hockey. Boxing? Uh, boxing. Is it lacrosse? No, nope. it's basketball. Has the most injuries. There's no pads, elbows, fists, everything to the face all the time. And a lot of people dunk, and those nets are metal or string. And when those strings get caught around the teeth, it rips them out. We have a lot of people that dunk basketballs and it rips out teeth when they get caught in those nets. So, and a lot of people don't wear mouth guards when they play basketball. That's our number one 
dental injury sport is basketball. So there's your temporal bone. And here's your suture bone. Remember what suture, suture bones are? Where two bones come together and they form a suture line. Sutural bone. Okay, hey, remember the name of that suture that runs along the bottom there. Between the occipital bone and the parietal bone. If I remember right, that was a lambdoid suture. It runs back between the occipital bone and the parietal bone. Okay, and this one is the occipital bone. You want to say that one, Ashley? <laughs> occipital. Occipital bone. <laughs> Like simple bone is the most posterior bone in the skull. Okay. Mandible. Mandible. That's the, the bone that hinges, contains the lower teeth. Maxilla. Maxilla. Is the front bone. Zygomatic bone. Zygomatic bone. bone. Okay. That's the one that forms the arch. Okay. Nasal bone. You can see the nasal bone and next to it or adjacent to the nasal bone. Lacrimal bone. You have the lacrimal bone. Okay. And connecting from the side of the frontal bone. Sphenoid bone. The side of the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone is a butterfly shaped bone on both sides. You see how it has wings that comes across that zygomatic arch below, above and below it and extends to the other side just that same way. So it's like a big butterfly wing. It has a lesser wing and a greater wing that you'll go over to. And this is the frontal bone. Frontal bone. Okay. That's the side view. Okay, a little more uh, different areas on the side view. The opening on the side here is your external acoustic meatus. Okay. External acoustic meatus. That's where the ear canal runs. It goes into the tympanic or the eardrum, tympanic membrane or your eardrum. Okay. This is a lambdoid suture. Lambdoid suture. Runs between the parietal bones and the occipital bone. Okay. Parietal mastoid suture. That's between the parietal bone and the mastoid bone. Mastoid. What's, what's the, the key feature of the mastoid process? Remember, what's it made up of? Three small bones? Not three. That's, that's, the, that's the oracle inside the ear. Honeycomb. Um, there you go, honeycombs. It's a honeycomb, it's a sinus with a lot of space in between there. It's honeycomb appearance. I guess the skull a lighter weight. But that's the parietal mastoid suture. Then the occipital, occipital mastoid suture. suture. Run between the occipital bone and the mastoid process. And the external external occipital protuberance. Okay. That's the bait, that's the most posterior section of the occipital bone. Mastoid process. That's our mastoid process which has the honeycomb bones, makes the skull lightweight. And this is our styloid, styloid process. Styloid process. That's where your neck muscles connect. That's the little hook that comes out from the side of the skull. Okay. Zygomatic process. So your zygomatic process is like an arch. You can see why the side of the skull gets hit. That's the first thing that breaks. Let's come back here. Pterygoid process. Okay, that's from the pterygoid bone. It's your pterygoid process. This is a side view of the nasal spine. Remember that point that comes up from the very inferior part of the nasal Nasal cavity? spine. Okay. Temporal process. This is the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. It's a temporal process, temporal process of the uh, maxilla that extends into the zygomatic arch. Lacrimal fossa. Lacrimal fossa is in the lacrimal bone. What runs through the lacrimal fossa? The lacrimal duct, where the tears go through from the eye socket into the nasal cavity. Sphenosquamous suture. Okay. Between the sphenoid bone and the and it's squamous, squamous bones, so suture of it. And this is your squamous suture. Squamous suture. That runs between the uh, parietal bone and the temporal bone. And the other suture is? Coronal, coronal suture. The coronal suture. That runs between the frontal bone and the parietal bone. Okay. Back of the skull. You can see the parietal bones on the side. You can see the suture bone. A sutural bone is any place where two bones have grown together and fused into a joint that is immovable. 
Okay, that's a sutural bone. Okay, whether it's a so the coronal suture, the landoid suture, the frontal suture, whatever it is, okay, it's where the two bones have come together and fuse. You see that simple mastoid suture, the superior nocal line, which is just a line with the muscles attached to the base of the skull above the external occipital protuberance. Again, the external occipital protuberance is this bump right here. Okay? And that's the most posterior part of the occipital bone. Okay? Then you have the occipital bone, you have the temporal bone on the side, your landoid suture. Remember the landoid suture is between the parietal bone and the occipital bone. The sagittal suture goes right through the midline, is between the two parietal bones. Okay. See the little hook right here on the bottom? What's that little hook right there, that bone sticking out? The styloid process. See the blow up. Styloid process. And just to the right of that or lateral to it, what's the process there? Mastoid. Mastoid process. Perfect. Perfect. All right. And looking at the top of the skull, okay, you can see the frontal bone and occipital bone, most anterior, most posterior. You can see the parietal bones on the side, and you see your sutural bone. You see the sagittal suture, like I said, is between the two parietal bones. The coronal suture is between the frontal bones and the parietal bones. And the landoid suture is between the parietal bones and the occipital bones. That's where your main fontanelle develop. The anterior fontanelle, is between is between where the coronal suture and the sagittal suture meet, and the posterior fontanelle in an infant skull is where the occipital bone and the parietal bones meet. Okay? That's where those openings still are. We might have some pictures of the of the infant skull here too. All right, looking inside here. All right, if you look at the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone, let's see if we'll light it up. See how it looks like a butterfly? Lesser wing of sphenoid. There's a lesser wing and a greater wing of it. Okay? Sphenoid bone is a butterfly-shaped bone that runs and attaches to the ethmoid bone inside the skull and attaches to the sides of the two temporal and parietal bones. Same. So you have a lesser wing of the sphenoid and a greater wing of the sphenoid. Greater wing of sphenoid. You can see why they're called that. The lesser wing is smaller. The greater wing is greater. is larger. Okay. Starting at the top, we have the frontal bone. Frontal bone. And then the crystal 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 is the The crystal runs right between the center of the ethmoid bone. That's the bone that sticks up between the cribriform plate. The cribriform plate is all those little holes, and the crystal is a piece of bone that sticks up on top of it. Okay? So the crystal is like a, like a cribbage board, all those little holes. Those are holes for the olfactory nerves to run through. For, uh, for cranial nerve, that's your first cranial nerve. Okay, the cella turcica, okay? Cella turcica. Is part of the, uh, the ethmoid bone, and that forms a bone around the uh, pituitary gland. Okay, that's what protects it. Okay, so if, you get a, if we get a chance to dissect the skulls, you notice all the pituitary glands are pulled off because cella turcica forms an actual case around, like a C-shape. So when they take the brain out, it pulls the pituitary glands out. It's kind of by a stalk. We're able to see that. But the silica turcica is the bone that surrounds the pituitary gland and protects it. And you see the temporal bone temporal on the side bone. and the occipital bone in the back. Occipital bone. Okay. Questions so far? Good. All right, again, looking at the top view of the skull here, you have your superior orbital fissure. Superior orbital fissure. That's in the very back of the eye on the very top portion. You have your internal. Internal acoustic meatus. Internal acoustic meatus. That's where the canal runs up into the tympanic membrane, up to the ear canal. Okay. If we take the, take this off here. You can see your angle right there, where your tympanic member, your um, internal acoustic meatus runs. 
That way you can see it. Okay. Then you got the hypoglossal canal that runs to occipital bone, which innervates the tongue. Okay. And everybody remembers the big hole, right? Foramen magnum. Literally means foramen is whole, magnum is big, like a magnum champagne, big bottle. Foramen magnum is a big hole. That's in the um, occipital bone. Then you got your jugular foramen where the, the jugular vein runs. You got your foramen rotundum onto the ethmoid bone. See it there. You got the optical canal, which is right behind where the, that, which is your second cranial nerve, runs from the retina to the back of the eye into the lateral geniculate nucleus into the brain. That's where your images are, are projected when you see something. And you see the cribriform plate. And that bone, Okay, you have the cribriform plate with all the holes around that. And then what's this bone in the center here between the cribriform plate? You can see all little holes and the bone right in the middle. What's that called? So it's called the crista galli. Okay, that's the one that goes right between the cribriform plate. That's part of your ethmoid bone. So the cribriform plate is the holes in that plate. The crista galli is the one that comes right up in between it, kind of a ridge that rises above it and separates the right and left sides of your olfactory nerve. Okay. And looking at this again, you see the frontal bone. Okay. This is your crystal galley. This is, oh, so I can highlight it here. Crystal galley. That runs right up that ridge, right in between the cribriform plate. The ridge of bone. So the cribriform plate is all the holes where your olfactory nerve runs, your sense of smell. Then the sphenoid bone, sphenoid bone is shaped like a butterfly. Sphenoid bone. Kind of a butterfly. Has a greater wing, a lesser wing in the body of it. Occipital bone is the bone of the back, parietal bones along the side, and temporal bones below the parietal bone towards the side by the, below the ear. So far, so good. Okay. More structures to see the olfactory foramen. That's where the main nerves, all the little, the um, crystal galley, okay, and the cribriform plate. You see the cribriform plate, all the nerves run into one branch called your olfactory foramen. That transmits that one branch up to the central nervous system through the first cranial nerve. Okay, that's your olfactory nerve. And you see your optic canal runs. I want to know my things. Okay. That's where you're, you're from the retina of your eye. That's what comes up in the brain, then it crosses over through the optic chiasm, which we'll learn about. So the left eye goes to the right side of your brain. The right eye goes to the left side of your brain. That information crosses right where the optic canal runs through. It's called the optic chiasm. Okay, it's not a bone, but it's, it's a nerve tract. And we'll see that as we go on. You got your foramen spinosum, just below that. And you got your foramen lacerum on the inner portion, most meaty portion of that. Frame and magnum, nobody's in this frame and magnum on my test, right? I guarantee you'll see it. No one should miss it, right? Big hole. All right, jugular framing, your jugular vein runs, the carotid canal, where the carotid artery runs through, and your frame and ovale, which is the most superior one of those openings. I mean, those are the openings inside the skull. There we go. Okay, looking at the underneath part of it. You see the palatine bone, which makes up your hard palate. Palatine bone. Okay. You got the roof and mouth with your hard palate, and below that is the soft palate. It's all soft tissue. That's your hard palate. When you run your tongue over there, you can feel that bone. Okay. Yeah, your sphenoid bone. Like I said, that's your butterfly shaped bone. If I can make it without say moving on me. Sphen sphenoid bone. Hey, sphen it's, I got it. It looks like a butterfly. As you can tell that that bone. You got your temporal bone. And then looking at the bottom, you see the mastoid process, which is your hollow bone with your honeycomb appearance to it. Occipital bone, it's the bone in the back of the skull, which has a firm and magnum in it. Occipital condyles. What do the occipital condyles articulate with? The fossa of which bone? 
I'll give you a 50-50 chance. The Atlas or the Axis? Which one? Um. No takers, huh? It's the Atlas. It allows your head to rotate okay, and do that no motion. Okay. Those are the occipital condyles articulate with the, the fossa of the atlas. Satellite cross is a hook that hangs down. It's hard to see in this picture. Okay. But it's a hook that comes down. It's easier to see in the lateral view with a neck muscle attack. Then you got the vomer bone, makes it the middle of the nose, which supports your inferior nasal concha, your zygomatic bone, and your maxilla. Now look at the zygomatic bone. Zygomatic bone. Okay, you can see how far that sticks out, right? So any injury to the side of the head is usually going to fracture the zygomatic arch. Okay, that's where you know if there's been lateral trauma, car accident, baseball bat, pipe, whatever, any kind of lateral trauma, you get the eye that droops. That supports the inferior lateral portion of the eye socket. That's what makes it up. If that bone breaks, that part comes down. Okay. And looking at the base of the skull again. Okay. On the maxilla, you have a little opening there. Openings are foramen. Okay. That is your incisive foramen because it's between the two incisor teeth. That's called the incisive foramen. If you want to get the two front teeth numb, you can use that foramen. Okay. Now, if you ever have to get that injection in the dental office, that one hurts. I don't care who gives it to you, that one's going to hurt. There's no soft tissue. There's no fat pads. It's just bone. And it does, it can bring tears to your eyes on that one. Okay, but it gets the two front teeth numb up there in the size of now. The greater palatine foramen is one of the back behind the second molar. Okay, that's a block and it'll get the, the back three teeth, back three or four teeth numb for you. The whole back part of the, the, the hard palate. Mandibular fossa. Let's look at the mandibular fossa here. I didn't say it. Mandibular fossa. There it was just late. All right. What is it? Let me get the mandibular fossa up here for you. All right. What bone is the mandibular fossa part of? Mandible. The mandible. Maxilla. Huh? Maxilla. Not the maxilla. The mandibular articulates. It fits into the mandibular fossa. But what bone is the mandibular fossa in? That will be on your test. It's in the temporal bone. The mandibular fossa of the temporal bone is where the condyle of the mandible fits up into. And that's the bone that the mandible slams into that causes concussions, causes the brain to rock. Right? So the mandibular fossa articulates with the condylar, the condylar head of the mandible, and it's part of the temporal bone. Okay. The foramen spinosum is an opening right behind, just a lat, a medial to that, I'm sorry. The foramen serum is just medial to that, and the foramen magnum is dead center, big hole. The styloid mastoid foramen, foramen, foramen is behind the styloid bone in the mastoid process. That's your styloid, mastoid, foramen. You have your jugular foramen, okay, where your jugular vein runs in, and your carotid canal, where your car carotid artery runs through. And the what was the mandibular fossa for again? What was that? What was the mandibular fossa for again? Or what was it connected to? Sorry. Hey, oh, no, no problem at all. Mandibular fossa sits right in the part of the temporal bone. Okay. And what fits into the fossa is the condylar head, the condyle of the mandible. That's what fits into it. Okay. It allows the mandible to rotate. So when that, this is your fossa, the mandible goes in there, and the mandible rotates and comes down along that fossa, the walls of the fossa. Okay. When your jaw pops, like it'll pop out of place and get stuck, it goes around that fossa and pops out of the fossa. That's what's causing your jaw to lock. And as you push down and back up. Okay. That answer the question? Yes, thank you. All right, no problem at all. And perfect. That was it. All right, anterior view, infant skull. 
Now we're going to start looking at the fontanelles. The anterior fontanelle. Anterior fontanelle. Okay. Is the main fontanelle of the infant. That's one right in the front where the frontal bone, the parietal bones and the frontal bones connect. Okay. You can see your frontal bone. You can see the frontal suture on the infant. You can see the maxilla and the mandible. Okay. We don't have much of an alveolar process yet because there's no teeth yet. You see the nasal bone and the coronal suture, which is between the parietal bone and the temporal bone. Okay. And, um, Again, you see your anterior fontanelle, which is your, one of the main fontanelles. You got the parietal bones on the side, occipital bone in the back, the mastoid fontanelle, where it hasn't fused yet. The temporal bone, you see the mandibular fossa as it starts. You know, this is your temporal bone right here. You can see the fossa right there, same where the mound's going to fit up into it. Okay. Then you got your mandible. This is your sphenoid fontanelle. Sphenoidal fontanelle. And you got your frontal bone. Okay. With anterior fontanelles, what you can tell with the infant clinically. If they're a, the, the fontanelle should be smooth and in shape with the rest of the skull. If the fontanelle is indented, okay, which means it's, it's sunken in, if you can see that soft spot, that means the infant is dehydrated. Okay? There's not enough fluid in the brain, and the fontanelle is starting to sag. It's not keeping enough pressure to keep it smooth with the skull. So the fontanelle should be skull. If there's an invagination or an indent where the fontanelle is, it means the, the infant of the child is dehydrated. That's another clinical sign you want to look for. Okay, here's your frontal suture. And again, here's your anterior fontanelle. Anterior fontanelle. Okay, you can see how large that is on an infant. That's the main soft spot. You have your parietal bones, your sagittal suture between the two parietal bones, the coronal suture between the frontal bones and the parietal bones, and you got your frontal bone. Okay. Same as the adult, it's just developing. Okay, posterior bones. This is the, the parietal bones. These are the two parietal bones. You can see the left and right parietal bones. What bone fits? See where the suture bone is? What bone fits in the posterior section right, right here? What bone fits into that? What bone's missing? Occipital bone. Occipital bone. I was expecting you to say that, Ashley. You had your chance. Yeah, I did. I I was going to say it, but I was like, no, I don't want to be wrong. <laughs> oh, <you're right. laughs> like simple bone and then your sagittal suits between the two parietal bones. Okay. This is the frontal bone. Okay. You can see, remember the glabella? The glabella, the glabella is the midpoint between the two orbits and just superior to that. That's your glabella. It's the point we use for reference. You have your orbital surfaces. You have the superorbital notch, which is a groove in the, 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 the orbital socket there. And you have the nasal spine sticking down into the nasal cavity. All right, looking, at the, uh, looking down the base of the skull. Okay, you have your occipital condyle, okay, which articulates with the atlas. You have your inferior nuchal line, which is part of the occipital bone. Your external occipital protuberance. External occipital protuberance. Which is that bump right in the most posterior part of the occipital bone. You have an inferior nuchal line and a superior nuchal line. That's where the muscle attached to the back of the head for the neck. It's a superior line and an inferior line. Okay. You have the external occipital crest and you have the foramen magnum. All right, temporal bone, okay? The temporal bone has a squamous region, a flat, squishy region. It has a petrous portion, which has like, uh, like, like grains of wood going right through. It's a petrous portion. Then you have a tympanic region. The tympanic region is associated with the opening to the tympanic membrane. That's your external acoustic meatus, as you can see right there. 
Then you have your mastoid region. Okay? So this is your temporal bone. A squamous part, which is this larger right region. Squamous region. The petrous region. Petrous region. The tympanic region. Tympanic region. Because that causes your tympanic membrane, which is exocusmatic, and then your mastoid region. Mastoid region. Which has your mastoid uh, process on it. Okay? That's a temporal bone. Looking at the side view of it, you can see the squamous region still. Squamous region. Okay, you see how large that is? It's a flat part of the temporal bone that connects up to the parietal bones. Petrous region. Or the petrous region was the internal um, on the side there. And then the mastoid region. Mastoid region. Which contains the mastoid process. Okay, what bone is this? It looks like a butterfly. The sphenoid bone. Sphenoid bone looks like a butterfly. It sits on both sides of the skull. You have your superior orbital fissure. It's the opening or the groove. Superior orbital fissure. That runs into the superior part of the of the op, of the oral of the, um, the eye socket. The op, op, where the optic nerve runs up through. You have the greater wing, which is the larger wing of it. Greater wing. And you have your lesser wing, which is a smaller wing. Lesser wing. Okay. You have a greater wing and lesser wing. Just the size it differentiates them. You have the foramen rotundum below the superior fissure. You have the sphenoidal sinus, which sub up behind the eyes. That's when you get a, a migraine with, between your eyes. It's the sphenoidal sinus causing that problem. You can see the body of the sphenoid bone. Body. The body connects the lesser wings to the greater wings. And you got your pterygoid process. Pterygoid process. Okay. Your foramen ovale. Foramen ovale. Okay. All right, other side of the, the phenoid bone. You can see the greater wing again. Greater wing. And the lesser wing when you compare the two. Lesser wing. And then you see the body of it be between the two wings. If I can get it to, to block out. There body. Again, okay, your superior orbital fissure and your pterygoid process. All right, looking at the top part of it again. Everybody sees the greater wing and the lesser wing, right? Okay. The optic canal, the optic canal. Optic canal. is where your optic nerve runs through, cranial nerve number two. That's for vision. Okay. And where are we at? Foramen ovale. You can see the side of that. And the foramen spinosum, just lateral to that. The cella turcica. The cella turcica is a C-shaped uh, bone. Where the pituitary gland sits inside and kind of clamps around it and protects the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland carries out a lot of functions of the body, which you'll learn about all the different hormones to create that. It's very important to protect that gland. You see the body of the sphenoid bone and the foramen rotundum. Question. There. I have a question, real quick. What's that? So you said when the brain is removed, normally the pituitary is removed as well. How does, I mean, do they cut that out of the bone or what? No, no, the, the, the bone encases it, so you have a C-shape, the, the connection's in here, and the glands inside of it. The glands bigger than the opening. So when they take the brain away from the skull, when they separate it, so you get dissections, the pituitary gland stays in there. They don't dissect it out. You have to cut the whole bone to get it out like intact. Okay. 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 So we do our skulls, you don't see the pituitary gland. Got it. You see the little stalk, which is called the infundibulum, where it attaches to, but they take oh. that out. I'm not running my, that's a good point. I'm not running my, um, what do we call it? The chat. They put the chat up in case someone wants to type a question. There's no questions yet, so. I'll run that up there. Yeah, okay, I didn't have it up. All right, so we got all that. But that's what the silica trusia. The silica trusia surrounds the pituitary gland. I'm using the wrong mouse again. All right. This is your ethmoid bone. Remember the ethmoid bone? It's surrounded by the sphenoid bone. It connects into the base of the frontal bone. The ethmoid bone controls the crystal galley and the cribriform plate, where your olfactory nerve run, cranial nerve number one. Okay, you have ethmoidal air cells. 
which are the air cells behind up above superior to the eye. You have the orbital plate, which is part of the eye socket. You have the middle nasal concha. Okay, you can see the middle nasal concha here. Middle nasal concha. Okay, remember you have an inferior nasal concha, a middle nasal concha, and a superior nasal concha. You have three on each side, on the right and the left side. Then between the nasal concha, you have what's called a perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. The perpendicular plate runs perpendicular to the main cross section of the ethmoid bone. And you have the lateral mass. Lateral mass. Which is the entire side, the most lateral portion of the ethmoid bone. And again, the crystal galley, okay, is the bone that sticks up. You can see the little spine or process right there. That's what sticks up above the cribriform plate with all those little holes, all these little holes. Okay. Looking at the side, you see the orbital plate, which supports the bottom portion of the eye socket, or the, I'm sorry, the lateral portion. You have the crystal galley, which is that part that sticks up between the cribriform plate. You have the perpendicular plate, which runs right between the middle nasal concha, perpendicular to the main section of the ethmoid bone. Okay, and you have the middle nasal concha that extends into the nasal cavity. All right, side view of it again. You see the crystal gal sticking up. You have the lateral mass, which is the main portion on the side. Okay. You have the perpendicular plate, which runs perpendicular to the main body of my bone, which goes between the two middle nasal concha. Okay. You have the superior nasal concha, you can see above that now. We didn't have that before. Superior nasal concha. Okay, so there's your superior, and below that... Middle nasal concha. You have the middle, and below that you have the inferior nasal concha. You have your ethmoid air cells. Okay. And the mandible. <laughs> okay, mandible. The mandibular condyle. The condyle is the part, back part, mandibular condyle of the head that articulates with the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. That's what allows the mandible to hinge. Okay, the coronoid process. The coronoid process is anterior to the mandibular process, the mandibular, the mandibular condyle, and the mandibular notch. It's hard to see in this one because these are sitting in front of it. Coronoid process. But that's the coronoid process. The ramus of the mandible? Ramus. Is the entire section after the angle where it comes up. Okay. Let's see. The angles between the body and the ramus. Body. Of the condyle. So right between the body and the ramus is the angle. The alveolar ridge is the part that holds the teeth in. Alveolar margin. The okay. alveolar ridge or margin is the same on the top and bottom teeth. Then mental foramen is that. Mental little? foramen. The little hole right there, okay, where the mental nerve exits from the inferior alveolar nerve. The branch that comes through there is a mental foramen and innervates your lower lip. That's where your lower lip gets done when you work on bottom teeth. Because bottom teeth, you have to get the whole side numb. Top teeth, you get each individual tooth numb because the bone is thin. The mandible is one of the thickest bones in the human body. Okay? You can't just put anesthetic. It won't infiltrate through it. So you have to go after it right between where the mandibular condyle is and get the nerve numb before it enters the bone. Once you do that, then it gets the nerve numb. So the mental, the mental nerve gets numb also, and that means your lips can be numb. That's one of the signs that the anesthetic is working. So that's your mandible. This is another view. You can see the mandibular condyle. Mandibular condyle. The coronoid process. Coronoid process. A little bit better now. And this is your mandibular foramen. Mandibular foramen. That's where the inferior alveolar nerve enters into the condyle. That's where you have to get it numb. You have to put the tip of the needle right there and find that nerve before it goes into the bone. If you get behind it or in front of it, it's not going to work. You've got to get right there. You have to know your anatomy, actually, to do that kind of a block. That looks deep. What's that? Oh, I said that looks deep. Inch and a half. That's why that's why we put the needle. The needle goes an inch and a half in. It's for your 27-gauge needle. Goes an inch and a half. And it's usually between an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half deep. But you're right. It has to go through the, the, the mandibular triangle and penetrate that. Okay. It's, it's, not, it's not painful. It's not, you don't feel it if you do it right because you inject it as you go along. So it gets it numb. But it, it is deep. 
It's one of the deeper nerves you have to go after. Uh, the mandibular notch is right between the uh, mandibular see. notch. The mandibular notch is between the mandibular condyle and the mandibular coronoid process. It's the groove that connects those two. And again, you see the ramus, you see the angle, you see the body, and the mental frame and the alveolar ridge or alveolar margin. Okay, looking at the back of the condyle, you can see the mandibular foramen really well here. Mandibular foramen. That's where that nerve runs. You see the body of the mandible, the mandibular angle, and the ramus that comes up. The mandibular condyle, I mean, the coronary process, and the alveolar margin holds the teeth in. Now you can see this patient here, or this person, you can see the bone loss from the front teeth. Okay, the bone level is supposed to be about, that's about 50 to 70% bone loss. That's what's called periodontal disease. That's most adults, that's the problem for losing teeth. It's not the decay. But you see where the bone level is really low. And that's, that's advanced bone loss there. Those teeth will start to get mobile pretty soon. All right. So this is the maxilla. Maxilla holds the top, te the the top teeth in place. Okay, you can see your infraorbital foramen, which is the bottom of the eye socket. Okay. You can see the orbital surface, which forms a, the base of the eye socket. You see the frontal process where the frontal bone comes down, and your anterior nasal spine, the, the spine, the nasal spine, the bottom of the nose there, nasal cavity, and your alveolar ridge. Okay, outside of here, the lacrimal groove. What runs through the lacrimal groove? The lacrimal duct. Duct, perfect. Lacrimal duct carries the lacrimal gland. Forms tears across the eyes. Those tears run through the lacrimal duct into the nasal cavity. You have the frontal process, where it connects to the frontal bone, the anterior nasal spine, the incisive canal. That's that canal that runs on the hard palate and the roof of your mouth, right between the two central incisors. Okay. Then you have your alveolar ridge, your alveolar margin, your palatine process, which is your hard palate, and the maxillary sinus. That's the sinus where you get infections there. That's the one that causes the whole side of your face to hurt. Your teeth hurt, everything hurts on that side. It's a general pain. And it, the key you wanna look at, at an, uh, if you're patient, you wanna see if the pain changes when they change head position. You can get worse when they lay down, you get better when they stand up. Because the pressure in the sinus will change with gravity within the sinus. So yeah, that's one of the diagnostic things you will look for when you're evaluating a patient. All right, palatine bones that make up the palate. Okay, you got your orbital process, make up the eyes, the sphenoid process, the connective bone, your perpendicular plate, which runs perpendicular plate, perpendicular to the main body of the ethmoid bone. You got the horizontal plates, which run horizontal, okay. horizontal, horizontal plate. Okay. And then you got what's called a pyramidal process, most posterior part. Now, it's shaped like a pyramid. Pyramidal process. Pyramidal or pyramidal. But pyramidal process, okay? So that is your, your palatine bone. That's the hard palate. All right, looking at the side of the skull. Okay, here you can see the cella turcica. That's what I want to show you. Cella turcica, cella turcica. Okay, you can see how it curves around and it forms a C shape. That's where the pituitary gland fits inside of. You can see your frontal bone, your frontal sinus. Frontal sinus. Okay, that's the airspace right between the eyes. Your ethmoid bone. Ethmoid. Okay. Ethmoid bone has the uh, crystal galley and the cribriform plate. Cella turcica is part of the sphenoid bone. The vulnerable bone is below the bone. Vomer. Okay. You see the mandible. You see the pterygoid process. The sphenoid sinus. Sphenoid sinus. The occipital condyle. Occipital condyle. Okay, that's where the occipital bone makes contest with the atlas okay, and allows that ro the rotation of the head. Okay, and the no, no back and forth. Okay, see the temporal bone, which is the side here. Temporal bone. Occipital bone in the back. Occipital bone. And the parietal bone along the sides. Parietal bone. And the frontal bone in front of that. Frontal bone. Frontal bone. Okay. That's the side view of the skull. 
Okay, bones that form the orbit of the eye. Okay, you can see the frontal bone, its portion. Frontal bone. Connects the whole superior ridge of the orbital socket. Okay, the sphenoid bone connects the lateral portion. Sphenoid bone. And the most inferior part, the zygomatic arch. Zygomatic bone. Okay, and you see that makes up the lateral and inferior portion. So when it breaks, it gives way, the eye droops. It because the lateral and the uh, bottom, the inferior portion is gone and the eye droops down. You can see the maxilla. Maxilla. Which makes up the rest of the inferior and medial portion of the eye. Palatine bone. Palatine bone. Comes up from the heart palate. And the lacrimal bone. Lacrimal <laughs> and the ethmoid bone. Ethmoid bone. That helps to make it up. Those are the bones that make up the, the forms the orbit of the eye. I think I got one more slide of this. This is a hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is the only bone in the human body that is free floating, has no articulations with any other bone. It's the only bone that doesn't come in contact with any other bone. Okay? It just floats. And you can see the picture up here, it floats underneath the mandible. Not a great picture, but that's where it floats. That's a hyoid bone. That is always on the nursing exams. It is the only free floating bone in the human body where it doesn't take with anything. It just hangs out there. His muscles connect to it. It has a body, a greater horn, and a lesser horn. All right, any questions on the skull so far? And the hyoid. What's that? The oh, the hyoid is the anchor for the tongue, right? It's a, a lot of hypo, hyoglossal muscles coming to that, yes. So the tongue and neck muscles both connect to it. Can you go back to the previous slide? Sure. Please and thank you. This one? Yeah. Okay, what do you got? Just taking notes. Oh, okay, no problem. That's just forms that it shows you what bones make up the socket of the eye socket. All right, perfect. I got it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. No problem at all. All right, so let's see what you guys remember. Let's take a quiz. 20 points. Which bone is highlighted on the infant skull? The frontal bone. Frontal bone. Okay. okay. Behind it is the parietal bone, below is the temporal bone, and the very back is the occipital bone. That is the frontal bone. And you're actually correct. All right, which bone is highlighted? I'll give you a hint. It looks like a butterfly. The phenoid bone? Perfect. You got it. It's phenoid bone. Okay. Uh, what do I want to say with that one? That makes up the bridge here. What, what um, gland does the sphenoid bone protect? The pituitary. The pituitary gland. And what's the, what's the bone, shrine pituitary gland that protects it? What's it called? Can you repeat the question? What's the part of the sphenoid bone that surrounds that pituitary gland? It's called a specific name. It's called the cella, cella trisica. That's yeah. the bone of the sphenoid bone. That's a part of the sphenoid bone that surrounds or encompasses the pituitary gland. Like I said, we'll go through a lot of that too, but let's check our answer there. That one's correct. Number three, which bone is highlighted? Everybody should get this one. Ashley, you like to say this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's the occipital bone. You see that big hole in the occipital bone? What's that? Raymond Magnum. Uh, Raymond Magnum. Nobody should miss on the test, right? Right. We said that many times. And this is the occipital bone. All right, perfect. Oh, turn off the highlights. Check the answer. Correct. Okay, which structure is highlighted? The lesser wing. The lesser wing of the sphenoid bone, right? The greater wing runs below it. I would, I would check that. Yep. Lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. Salaturcica is also part of the sphenoid bone, which that's one that encases the pituitary gland. The temporal bone is way to the side, and the greater wing is, is inferior to that. Which structure is highlighted? 
It's right there. The external protuberance? External occipital protuberance. Perfect. Most posterior part, little notch, excuse me, of the occipital bone. You guys are doing really good. Um, let's take a look. See that hole right there? That big hole. What's that one? Is it the external acoustic meatus? Ex ex external acoustic meatus. Perfect. And what's that little hook that's hanging down? Styloid mass process. No. Yes. Styloid process. Styloid process. Perfect. You guys got this. Good. Which structure is highlighted? It's on an infant skull. Anterior fontanelle. Anterior fontanelle. That's the baby soft spot. Okay. And if that soft spot is depressed, when you look at the skull of the baby, what does that mean? It's dehydrated. Baby's dehydrated. Perfect. Which bone is highlighted? Zygomatic bone. Zygomatic bone. That's where if you hit it, it breaks that part. Yep. Zygomatic bone. What structure is highlighted? First of all, what bone is that? Um, the ethmoid. Yep. Perfect. That's the ethmoid bone. What's that little process there? Crystogali. Crystogali. That's what that sticks up above the cruciform plate, right? Yep. You got it. Perfect. What structure is highlighted? Um, that's the zygomatic process. It's a zygomatic process. Yep, that's the side there. Just a side view of it. And number 10, what is highlighted there? What First of all, what bone is it on, Ashley? <laughs> okay. You know what's going to be the occipital bone? Occipital condyle. Yeah, the occipital condyle. It's occipital condyle. What bone articulates with the occipital condyle? The atlas. The atlas. Perfect. You guys got it. All right. Halfway through. Number 11. What structure is highlighted? Um, The pterygoid process. Pterygoid process. That's the sphenoid bone, right? 